this is a yeah, unmute myself, please. Um, so this is a, a panel or uh, sponsored by the Mibunti Clifford Citizens Advisory Committee. It's a River Restoration Roundtable. I'm very excited today because we're going to learn from what our neighbors have been doing with their own rivers. Um, so it's a great learning session and a great time for everyone to ask questions and learn more from other examples. So tonight we have three really cool people who are going to tell us about their experience. Um, we have Billy Helprin. He has been the director of the Stones Menal Wildlife Sanctuary at Mount Desert Island since 2015. Billy coordinates multiple wildlife research and monitoring projects. He provides professional development for teachers and learning experiences for students, aimed at increasing interdisciplinary thinking, raising scientific literacy, and connecting people to their local outdoor environment. He manages the lands and water that comprise the sanctuary. Prior to working for the sanctuary, he was main post Heritage Trust MDI regional steward and has worked and studied wildlife in Utah, Wyoming, Ohio, Kenya, and Maine. Anyway. One of the long-term projects of the sanctuary has been the restoration and management of fish passage in the Soames Farm Long Pond watershed. Sanctuary staff and volunteers count and sample migrating alewives and offer migration-focused education programs with partner organizations to hundreds of students each spring. So this is a really interesting project that Billy is, is leading and is going to take us through that project. We also have Matt Foster, who drove from Farmington. I'm so appreciative of your time and driving tonight. Thank you so much. Matt is the, uh, the director of the Parks and Recreation for the town of Farmington. He has worked in managing public recreational facilities for over 13 years and was involved with the dam removal and park redesign and construction at Walton's Mill Pond in Farmington. This project restored access for adult Atlantic salmon through Sandy River and Temple Stream. And uh, Matt has just actually shared an experience with me when he saw the salmon, so we hope he's going to share it with you too tonight. He uh, has served as the board of director of Maine's oldest nonprofit organization, the Bunny Woods Corporations, for six years, and has, like I do, a passion for municipal government, outdoor recreation, natural resource management, and enjoys fishing, backpacking, mountain biking, skiing, and many other pressure activities. Thank you, Matt, for coming. And finally, tonight, we have Sayona Elbridge. Uh, Sayona is the senior project manager for the land protection uh, staff at Maine Coast Heritage Trust. She works with landowners, towns, land trusts, state and federal government on a wide variety of conservation and restoration projects. Sayona was one of the point people in the set of projects that restored fish passage to the Bagadus River. She will talk about some of the many lessons learned from efforts to restore the Bagadus River in Hancock County. All of our speakers tonight have shared with us their website link that will be on the, the River Committee website. Um, we also may have a fourth guest. Is Don joining us? Do we know yet? Stay tuned. We'll stay tuned. If Don joins us, we'll be introducing them. I think we're starting with Sayona, you're our first uh, speaker today. So, Bina, we're, we're having one presentation and question at the end of each presentation or question at the end of all presentations. What, how do you want to structure this? I had initially thought questions at the end, but obviously if you have very specific questions for Sayona, you can, you, know, you can ask at the end and then what more general questions we'll save for the end. So please welcome Sayona and enjoy the presentation. <laughs> So good evening. Thank you, everyone, for coming out on the evening to hear about uh, rivers uh, and talk about rivers. This is really great. I'm so glad for anyone going to come to see this. Uh, Parks Road to get out that door in February. So I'm here to talk about the Bagadoose River, which is up in Cascade, Scott, Brooksville area in Hancock County, um, where we did a set of five projects involving blockages, dams on that river um, over a five-year period. And um, this is really, I want to say this is work where land and water intersect. And that's such an interesting thing to think about in terms of, I work with a land trust, I had to work with a lot of fisheries biologists and people who think about different things from where what I usually work with. And that was a real, um, a great stretch, I guess. 
Um, and I'm ready for the first slide. So, the back. That's you, That's you, All right. This is an image of the, the watershed, just to give you sense. So, um, I think of the Magnus River as small, although I've learned that it's like four times the size of the Magnus Cup, so that felt exciting. Um, <laughs> it's about 12 miles long. It's a horseshoe shape, and it has a whole lot of ponds and streams that feed into it. And it's about a 42,000 acre watershed with four different towns in it. And um, Passage was restored to seven ponds and about 30 miles of streams. Uh, and what I worked on, as I said, was five different projects. And to give you a sense, um, we had to do, we ended up with two nature-like cool and weird fishways, one small dam removal, one dam stabilization with the fishway uh, renovation, let's say, and then one state road crossing replacement. So all sorts of different projects, and you'll get to see pictures of those. There were so many different organizations and agencies involved, and to, as an example, I needed 29 permits for those projects from all different agencies, federal and state, and it means talking to them in great detail. So next slide, please. Um, I'm going to start with one of the talking points of our work, um, which has many goals and many talking points, but the ill life as a fish was a great one for me to learn about and think about in this work, really because ill life are a fish that go between freshwater and saltwater. They need to come home to spawn. And that's such an interesting concept in terms of thinking of these fish who then, you know, they're born in a pond, they swim down a stream, and they head down to the Carolinas. So what we do here for ill life matters all of that region from here down in the Carolinas in the ocean, and then they come back and they want to come to that pond, which is such an interesting um, migration pattern to think about, and it means you need to really think about their home. It's their home, too. Next slide. Um, I'm going to start with one of the projects called Pierce Pond, which is in Penobscot. This is in 2017. This is a small town-owned boat ramp that was kind of ragged. And there was a lot of fear of change of water levels, fear of change of this boat ramp, of the quiet little town area that it had. And as we learned more about, um, I can't really show you, but if you think of the boat ramp and maybe most of the curve around of the shoreline, a 90-foot berm is actually an earthen dam that was put in for one of the five mills on this stream um, between here and the ocean. And this is what this all looked like before, and there were a lot of people very concerned about this space and potential change and water levels. Next slide, please. I and others had a lot to learn about engineering. What, do you, what does it look like to engineer um, a change that removes a berm or a dam like this, keeps the water levels the same, and allows the fish to come in and out? This is an engineering of the pool and weir system at this site. Next slide. And as we learned, we communicated out, just as we're doing today, and as you have been doing for some time, communication out to anyone who's interested and hopefully more, writing to landowners, reaching out to all. It's so important to explain what you're doing and show why and how you get there. Next slide. We eventually embarked on construction of that same site. Construction on fishways is not small equipment, it's big. And um, that's really important to get across and sort of warn people of. And there's also a really key timing point in these fishways work. In-stream work in Maine is always between July 30th and September 30th, right in the key summertime season. And that's always a consideration um, to know in terms of timing. Next slide. This is what that same fishway looks like today. That same um, earth and dam and that same pond stays at the same level. We now have these pools and weirs out of it and their public education space with some signs and a better parking area and a better ramp. Next slide. 
I'm going to take you through a couple other projects just to show you some before and after. This is White's Pond in the same town. I was working very closely with the town government in this town and the um, local alewife committee here. This was a small dam with an Alaskan steep pass fishway. You can see on the right that got some fish over. Um, very important for duck hunting and fishing. And if you go to the next slide, not a small stream below it. But this is a pretty significant stream called Winslow Stream. Next slide. This is how it came out. So this is another what's called a nature lake fishway pool and weir system, five pools and weirs. Keeps a pretty large lake behind it or pond behind it intact mm. and um, water level wise and lets the fish come up and down. And it has held up for all these crazy storms and rains so far. Next slide. Um, we then had a third, um, more complicated site, and actually Mike from Interpoop was our was our guy on this one. Um, so helpful in a site that has um, an intact dam. That's sort of what you can see right here. Yeah, thank you. And you have a home very nearby, and a couple other homes <laughs> near this one. Next slide. There's a lot of history in this watershed, just like in yours. Um, there's always a story to how the watershed has changed, how the stream flows differently now, how many blockages are there. And this really has to do with an industry, 1700s and 1800s, all around Maine, there were over 1200 dams put in on the streams run, um, to run the mills that needed to you know, make the lumber, card the wool, do all these things that we all needed in those times. So in, um, I was looking in records to learn the history of the Vagadoos in 1877, there were 39 water powers in this watershed, doing all those important things. This mill was on that site I showed you the photo of. Um, it burned in the 1960s, so very much in living memory for many people. Uh, it was really important to leave in place. Next slide. And, um, Stabilization of this old dam was really important. Uh, while we were working on it, the Maine Emergency Management Agency came and inspected it and said, whoa, you guys need to pay attention to this dam because this is old and needs stabilization help. So that became a focus. Um, and so, you know, cost over time and um, future resilience, all of our concerns, as well as trying to build in some public education on that site. Next slide. This is how it looks now. Um, we had to, we had so many interesting factors here that I don't have time to get into, but the, all this concrete is a combination of stabilization of that existing dam. And believe it or not, um, this is one way for juvenile outflow of alewife. They are actually able to do that drop and land and head out into the river um, as needed. So we were building in juvenile outflow um, this was a pretty complicated location with a, the pond above this is about 697 acres in size and a lot of landowners and homeowners with frontage were watching it closely. Um, it's also one of the most important fire safety water draws for the peninsula. So next slide. We had to build in a safe place and a way for the fire trucks to be able to draw water from this site as well, which is an exciting complication <laughs> for a project. Um, but great, we were able to create a safe off-road parking the first time. We were able to make it so that one person can fill a truck instead of three who were needed every time to fill the truck with the old way. So that was a really important consideration in terms of improving this site. And, you know, we want... We don't all love signs, maybe, but they are such a great way to share story. So you'll see these signs are on that site at Walker Pond, and they have the image of that mill. They have an image of an 1870s fisheries report that tells the story of the commissioner who made them dig in a fishway around the mill, one of the first in the state, and it actually worked. And we tried to capture some of that story in these signs, which Mike and I put in in the winter. Um, and so many school classes and different groups of people come and use this property now because those signs help them tell the story. They don't need a person to always tell it, they can go do it themselves, which has been a real bonus. <laughs> Next slide. Um, we then had to tackle this really beautiful sub watershed you can see up here, which had a lot of fish potential, but it had a single blockage down below there 
in an aging hung culvert under a state roadway. This was pretty daunting. It was not on DOT's um, work plan at all. Needed attention, it was very expensive. Um, we needed to detour around it right in tourist season, which was not fun. Um, the select board of the town here really leaned into this and were great to work with and made all the difference. Um, next slide. We had the largest crane in Maine have to come and help us with this, uh, which was very exciting. You can see the scale of, of what this means when you have to rip up a state highway and detour entirely around it in order to get a stream um, street underneath. Uh, and this was the first time that DOT did a project with partners funding it, um, not just a town. And that was a real stretch for DOT. We didn't really have processes in place to do it. We made them and we broke new ground. And I hope that others are able to build on that and do that as well. Next slide. This is what that looks like now. Mm -hmm. um, and we, it was built to an 80 to 100 year lifespan. It's holding up well. And last slide. So I'm going to sort of summarize here by saying this was, as I said at the start, it was five years. Um, it was a set of five projects. We raised about $3 million to pay for all of them so the towns weren't paying for them. We also had some great landowners donating stone, donating time, being part of these projects in so many ways that were so important to help save costs. We did focus on the fish with the bumper stickers. We have an annual celebration up there called Ale Life Day where 300, 400 people come. Um, I hope you will too. Um, it's really been fantastic in bringing people to a small town. But this was so much about, um, about so much more than fish. This really was about tying people back to their sense of place. Tying people back to a river that they had barely noticed was there. And now they were excited to learn more about, hear more about, go see when the fish are running and think about this as part of their place. We were also trying to bring back the heritage fishery. People haven't been fishing alewife in this river for some time. And now there is a heritage and educational fishery that is starting to be built back. Um, creating bait for lobstermen being sold and the funds go to the town from that. We also tried to build in those public spaces where we could, the places with the signs and, and with a trail that really allow particularly school classes to sort of um, start to learn and think and understand and go touch a fish or watch them swim by and get a sense of what's happening. Um, the schools around the river are now working together to build a curriculum around watersheds and fish passage restoration and to really bring it into the classrooms. There's also a lot of science being done now that these fish are back and running in the numbers they are. We send, we have citizen scientists who are sending scales um, to scientists in New York, Maine, and California as part of a national study around fish health. And I'll just name also that there's a three-town alewife committee that was formed. They're appointed by three towns around the watershed who really focus on continuing building volunteers and education around all the fish runs. So that's it for me. And I'm happy to take any questions, or else I will pass it on to the next, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. <laughs> any specific questions? Yeah. I just, I just want to say that's amazing. <laughs> How did you it do is it? amazing. It's great. <laughs> do that in five years. That's mind blowing. Yeah, well, <laughs> it was a lot of people and a lot of grant sources and, and multiple town governments. And it was so, it was effort by so many. And that is what it takes. But once you get the momentum building, it's really great what can happen because the momentum picks up more and, and builds. Did you have any of these um, structures uh, have their own sort of personality and the speak to the towns people whereby they held them as special structures? Everyone. <laughs> Everyone. And I think that's one of the challenges, but it's also one of the opportunities of this work. Um, you know, every one of these places was really special the way it was. 
PiercePod was the hardest because it was the first. People didn't know what to expect. They couldn't imagine what it might look like. And I had a really, you know, there were a set of landowners who were really concerned. But in the outcome, they've come to love it even more because it respected the heritage. It respected the quirks of that place. It respected what makes that place special to them and how it came out. And it made it better. It made it you know, we had 200 year flood events the year we were trying to do that construction. And that was a reality check in terms of that earth and berm and thinking, whoa, that could have blown out. We stabilized it so that it couldn't as part of that larger project. So building in that resilient thinking and, and respecting what is there and what makes that place special is, is the balance that it takes to do this kind of project. Thing. Amazing, well done. Yeah. Hey, um, so that was marvelous presentation. I, I thought that the um, oh, so uh, one of your slides, which was uh, very important, it seemed to me, was the mill that was on one of those sites. Yeah, and you know, to to me here locally, it's the mill sites that were you know they were the archetype of the identity of using water power to find, you know, to essentially build an economy. And so I, you know, a little bit to me, um, this was heavy on science and a little bit light on on, on history. Mm -hmm. And the adaptive reuse, you know, that kind of, you know, using history as a way to unlock a different conception of the future is I, I was glad to see the slide, and um, it seems to be a really important point that um, I'm glad you mentioned. Absolutely, and it's it was really important to this work, and it is, I think, because you know I have benefited from having a terrific volunteer researcher who researched the history of all the 27 mills in this watershed, and found images whenever she could, found documentation of it, and that story on the places where we could put in a public area with a sign or signs that explained it, that story and those images are on those signs. So they're captured at that place and therefore can become part of that place into the future. So I agree with you. It's so important to carry that heritage. And it's a wonderful opportunity to tell that story when you can build in a public space and capture some of that. But Thank you. Can... I'm gonna just Keep us going. Yeah. So Matt, you're up next. Great. <laughs> Make sure he gets up there. <laughs> Turn that one down. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Uh, Matt Foster, Director of Parks and Recreation for the Town of Farmington. I am not going to give you as great a presentations as uh, the other people that are here tonight. I'm just here to tell you that uh, our experience in Farmington from the municipal side, I've been a director of parks and recreation for about eight and a half years now as the assistant director, four and a half years before that. And my primary responsibility with the project that I was involved with, the dam removal and uh, revitalization of our park, uh, it was really about my responsibility as the department head for the town of Farmington and making sure that the taxpayers were taken care of, my department was taken care of, and we did the best we could for our taxpayers. So kind of like the, the long and short of the story I'm going to give you here a little bit. Um, but we have a dam, well, had a dam that was about 200-ish years old. Um, here's an aerial view here. You can see it's all old fieldstone dam. Uh, more improvements that have been done over the years, old boardwalk and everything. Um, and on the side of it, you can kind of see the park. Uh, on the pond side, there was a park. And on the downstream side, the park kind of encompassed the whole thing. Uh, that was like many old dams and mills and everything else, they become the property and problem of taxpayers at some point. They are become abandoned or gifted to municipalities, and then we're left to kind of clean up the messes. The traditional way of dealing with this has been just leave it. Don't do anything with it. Just let it run its course. 
But over time, what they become is kind of an attractive nuisance, and they're a huge liability to uh, our town for people crawling all over them and falling off them, possibly. Um, they're obviously extremely difficult, as she mentioned, you know, how many permits, 39 permits or 29 permits, whatever it was. Um, you know, we went through the same process. Anytime you want to do anything to a dam and work on them, it's just so much cost and permitting. So the way municipalities work is I'm the director of Parks and Rec. There's a dam next to my park, so I'm in charge of the dam and responsible for taking care of it. And it makes perfect sense. So um, my concern over the years was the amount of money that we had to save up. And I'm looking at these things, some of the things that you really can't see from the picture, but there's like a concrete wall, all the vegetation you can see to the right hand side there, that's growing out of a concrete wall that's like holding the home management. The lower side next to the stream, on the other side of the boardwalk, that's all undercut uh, concrete wall that's just hanging there. And I would walk out and look at this and just go, oh, how am I gonna pay for this? I really don't wanna deal with this. And then our park was built in 1980 um, after the dam was gifted to the town. Um, it was a little mill site, it started as a grist mill, then became a lumber mill over time and served a few different purposes. but. Once these things reach the end of their purposes for people, they become our problem. And we turn that problem into a little bit of a gift to the town. We use the land and water conservation fund grants from the National Park Service to trickle down to the state to uh, create a park along the stream side there. And I had talked with some people earlier about kind of during that period, some of the, the bad building parks and design was to bring a lot of things in from out of state. So we had a lot of exotics and everything that didn't really do well in the park. The park is, you know, 40 some odd years old and it was getting past its prime with the vegetation and everything. A lot of these species were dying and it wasn't in great condition. So I'm looking at this from, you know, director of a department. Oh, we've got a lot of problems. We have a park that's deteriorating. We have like vegetation that's past its prime. Like this, path, this park is really past its prime. This dam we put tens of thousands of dollars into every, you know, handful of years to do repairs and maintenance. And it's not, you know, there's a, there's a registry of dams. I don't know if any of your dams here on the registry of like critical, uh, you know, not- High hazard. High hazard or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have any of those or where they fall, but at some point these things need to be taken care of. And kind of luckily for us, when I was considering all this, we received a letter from the federal government and uh, it was, a letter telling us that we were in a take situation of an endangered species, the Atlantic salmon, because the Atlantic salmon had gotten to the base of the dam and they were spawning in the stream, right downstream, and they could not access the 50 miles of Temple Stream above, which is uh, what I've heard is like about the best spawning and rearing habitat for Atlantic salmon we have really left, like east of the Mississippi. It's some of the most critical habitat that we have to restore Atlantic salmon. So, you know, it's a really important area. And um, we, we got the letter. And to be honest, we said, if they're serious, they'll send us a note. <laughs> so we ended up getting a second letter and we said, okay, well, they're serious. It's at a point where we need to do something about it. So luckily, uh, the Atlantic Salmon Federation, I don't know if any of you are familiar with them, but they got in touch with the town of Farmington. And I was kind of the point person for this, working uh, with the town manager on the project. And we had a few initial meetings. You know, again, my job is to protect the town liability wise, taxpayers, funding wise. And, you know, I, I have to look at everything and everyone as, you know, with a grain of salt. Like, Everybody has an agenda, everybody has a mission, but luckily our missions really aligned well because it was really perfect timing for us because we were at a situation where we had to do something. I was at a situation where I had a, a dam that was not in good condition. I had a park that was not in good condition. And I had this organization whose mission was to restore Atlantic Salmon Habitat. And I happened to have 50 miles of some of the best stuff right behind this. So um, they helped us with the process much like what you guys are doing here, you know, having informational uh, sessions where people are coming in and sharing things with you. We went through the same thing with our community. It was super controversial. 
I've been asked to talk at a few other ones just because I've had this experience from the municipal side and every everything I've seen, it's really controversial because there is a passion. There's people who grew up, there's houses over here, there's houses up around the corner. You know, people grow up here. They have pictures of the kids playing there, they kayak up here, they fish there. And, you know, change is tough and it's, it's really not easy for a lot of people but that's where the controversy comes in because it, it has been a really big piece of our community for, you know, for 200 years. And that's, you know, when you name I'm so bad at that, I'm so sorry. Anyway, I was talking about the historical aspects of like the, the documentation and the interpretive areas, like that's what we've tried to incorporate a lot of this here. We don't lose that history that we have in this kind of things, but. Um, we created a whole new special area out of this, and, it, and we'll show you some pictures of that in just a moment. But um, so with us, the Atlantic Salmon Federation really took on a lot of responsibility to help set up the meetings and organize people. We had Inland Fishers and Wildlife, we had NOAA, we had uh, lots of representatives. We had an engineer, uh, much like Mike, that would come in and we looked at hydropower options. Was it viable to like fix the dam up to create hydropower? There really wasn't enough flow and the dam was so deteriorated. It was just, it wasn't feasible at all. Um, another option was putting in a fish ladder. I had reservations about a fish ladder, um, but that was going to be a, a large cost to the town uh, because that doesn't really, fish ladders don't really move fish nearly as well as just a free flowing river. So. We weren't able to get as much money for that. And then the the fight, and we had an option to do nothing, but then we had consequences with the federal government. You don't really want to be in that situation. So uh, the final option that we had was a dam removal. And the deal was really sweetened with like the a whole new park that was uh, given to us really during this process. And ultimately what happened was through all these informational sessions, which were very heated at times with, you know, with the dam removal process that gets pretty tricky to navigate. Um, we looked at a lot of the educational sessions and really mixed feedback from everyone. But ultimately what it came down to was, you know, getting the, the point across of the future, like for me especially, was the future ongoing costs and maintenance to the town and the taxpayers in my department and what we could do for saving the taxpayers in the future and making my life easier as a director of parks and recreation because I'm not, you know, qualified really to be taking care of dams and changing them and everything, but I just got stuck with it. So, um, but yeah, so we we ended up kind of going through the similar process and uh, went to referendum vote for the town where the options were laid out for taxpayers and ultimately the town overwhelmingly voted for dam removal, which. Uh, the Atlantic Sam Federation paid for every nickel, and they have been, you know, in the beginning, it was very, like, the town manager and I were very on guard because we knew that they had an agenda, but um, looking back on it now, um, you know, you kind of realize that any organization, I, I mean, I can't really say enough about ASF and how they've treated us and how well they've done, and they're still continuing to be our partner even after the project is complete because the project has been completed this past summer. But, you know, there's ongoing processes that they're watching, new issues that we come up with, any any new thing, that they are right there with us, and they're, they really helped to get the town what the town wanted, and they didn't really shove anything down our throats. So it was really nice when the, when the vote went through, and we knew that that's the process that we we're doing. We start setting up these, uh, like, committee to really guide the park. We had a lot of community input on that, what the community was missing, what they wanted. And I can start showing you some of the uh, results here. We have some before pictures. If you want to take a peek, this is after the dam was removed. We have a kind of overlook on the right hand side to kind of keep that. Uh, spot where the old mill was. We kind of want to keep that footprint overlooking to the, we have a nice big pool here and a couple up around the corner. You get that nice kind of falls there. Uh, we try to keep as many artifacts as we could. So throughout our park, there was a lot of uh, old field stone and uh, granite 
blocks and everything that help build the dam. So we we salvaged as much of the, the materials there to incorporate that into the park. And that was really important to us to kind of keep as much of that material <laughs> there historically. And this is uh, one of the water wheels that was just laying in the stream for, I mean, long before my time there. It's been laying there forever. And we thought, wow, what, that would be a really cool thing to put up as like kind of a little monument statue. And on this side, you can't really see it, but uh, so the overlook is here. So we have kind of a wooden deck area that kind of shows you where the flooring of the mill well, used to be. And kind of stretches up into here to an interpretative or interpretive center uh, with uh, some signage and history of the park. You see kind of the free flowing. I got to give a little bit of credit here to Sky Viking on Facebook for some of his photos because we did steal some of those because they're so good. Um, so you can go check out his Facebook page. We'll plug for him. So, uh, free flowing river here. If you want to go to the next one, uh, this is an evening picture kind of from. The water wheels right to the right of us, and this is that interpretive center here where we have the signs up. That they didn't, when I took the picture, they didn't have them. We ended up having a new bathroom facility, uh, a new pavilion you can see lit up in the back there. And the lighting in this park has been just so amazing at night. The daytime is really spectacular, too, obviously. But, you know, it's allowed us to have some new features to the park, pavilions and everything where we're doing some programming. Um, but... The landscape architect that we used, I was so thankful for uh, David Bain's studios out of Trump, I think, but um, he didn't, he wasn't just thinking about the daytime, what your park looks like, but you know, having it be uh, more of a 24 hour thing, especially like if you, if your community is looking at this, and I know like Camden is a, a very heavily touristed area, and when you can not just have the daylight hours be an attraction, but you can turn your park into like a, a nighttime wonderland where it's lit up and, and lighting goes a long way with parks too. It deters uh, a lot of things that you don't want happening, vandalism, and people hanging out. Um, a darker park is usually not as safe a park, so there's a lot of benefits to these as well. But, and so the path kind of leading up to the pavilion there. And the, the way the park looks now is really phenomenal. A lot of the people that had a hard time in the beginning that lived locally are super ecstatic now. Um, we had people intentionally seeking out to buy houses right nearby because they were, uh, they were so intrigued by living right close to the park. Um, and it's become less controversial over time. You know, it was super heated in the beginning. Once the decision was made and things started happening, you know, people started to accept it a little bit. And as time has gone on, a lot of the people who were very against it in the beginning come up to me and, you know, apologized or said that, you know, this was a, a lot better than they really expected it to be or what they thought it could be. So. But. Oh, yeah. So, um, so we have had uh, this past year. Oh, what is <laughs> it's all like <laughs> there's no one in that. Um, so yeah, this past year, I can't remember the exact numbers. Uh, Miranda Namath from ASF, she have the specific numbers. So we have that um, in Google um, this past year. And before that, previously, we've been putting uh, Atlantic salmon into the sand for quite some time. At least in the But it's uh, there that I had gone to Alaska the years back with my father, luckily, because I, you know, you get to experience this like enormous amount of nature that if you haven't been, you just really can't comprehend if you haven't experienced it. And after going there and coming back, you know, I grew I, I grew up in Central Maine, from Salt Maine. I don't know if you've heard of that. Nine hundred people. That's where I grew up. Uh, I come from four generations of hunting and fishing and logging uh, guides from Quebec, and uh, I spent a lot of time in nature. And when I walked up into the sandy, this place up in Phillips, uh, where I happened upon about eighteen. Uh, adult Atlantic salmon, and when I saw that whole pod of Atlantic salmon, it just like I literally gasped. And I don't know what my reaction would have been if I hadn't 
you've ever gone to Alaska and seen that. I really don't know what I would have done, but um, I immediately went back got my wife and I had four little kids, um, brought them back and showed them. And, you know, every single one of them, the same reaction was just gas. I've, I've fished all over the state. We've seen so many things. And it still just takes your breath away. You, know, you just can't comprehend seeing such a huge fish in such a little clear Thank you. Um, just in the interest of, okay, great, you get one, and then we're going to, out of the interest of time, we're going to keep going. Um, How many acres is the mark, he asked? Uh, I, it's, I think in around three to seven. I'm sorry, I don't know. That's a really bad answer for Director of Parks and Rec. <laughs> no. I just manage them. <laughs> yeah, so it's, we have, all, and the reason I say three to seven, because we have uh, a section of park, but we own a lot of land. And so I I can't remember. I've, heard, I've seen the different numbers, but I don't know exactly. That's okay. You did great. <laughs> um, we actually, yeah, we're okay. We actually have gone. On the line. Um, so I'm going to introduce him and hopefully he'll be able to speak. Don, um, can you hear us? But Don Clement is from Exeter and he's a long standing member of the town of Exeter, New Hampshire's Conservation Commission, as well as the Exeter Swapscott Local Advisory Committee. He also served three terms on the Exeter Land Board and participated in several projects studying the Exeter Swapscott River. Um, Don, can you hear us? We'll see. Don, can you? <laughs> Don, can you hear us? We'll come back to Don. I don't know if you can hear us. Uh, Billy, over to you. Sorry. Sorry. Oh. Yes. We are here. Yeah. I'll let you get up there. Sorry. So dark. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for having us here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit different than uh, Simon had with um, an old, old uh, town, which is similar from Canada, but in uh, Somerville in the center of Mount Desert Island. I've got a bunch of slides and we go through them fast for just the images that they drop and um, some things about the watershed uh, just gone out of the big one to go. Um, so here's and you can dim this down and get this one. Um, but yeah. this is um, Mount Desert Island and uh, this is Songs Sound here and Songville is right in here. And it's the, um, with the first European settled village starting in 1761 by Abraham Solms. And uh, we're going to be zooming in here in a second. This is Solms Pond. This is Long Pond, which is the largest lake on the island. It's about 900 acres. And the inlet's about a mile and a half from the cove where the fish migration starts. You can zoom in a little bit more. So here's, here's Solmsville, and there's a little mill pond and then it comes up um, and enters the salt pond and some of the fish most of them will stay in the salt pond and then some make it up to long pond if we go about more out of town. So just Abraham was the, the first uh vehicle settler there and he he dammed up the, the stream and it had a uh, sawmill on that dam starting in 1763 and then uh, Sonsville developed and it became really the commercial hub on the island long before the bar hub or anything else. Sonsville was the uh, kind of commercial area the blacksmith shops and the uh, selections building was still there. And uh, so there's a lot of history there and a lot of changes to the, to the watershed. Yeah. So here's, here's the, the mill pond so we over here. And so we uh, do a lot of education uh, to see uh, programs here. 
and the stream comes up into the south pond, comes through. There was another dam um, right up in here, so there was a shingle dome in the mid 1800s that's no longer in the water. This looks like a simple wetland, but it does have water and stream flowing through to the outlet of uh, um, Long Pond. You can see a lot of houses along the, the perimeter. This is all private property down to the south here, the Katie National Park in some, some places. And the Salt Menel Wildlife Sanctuary, which I'm the director of, uh, owns much of the land around the, the watershed here. And there's conservation easements on some of the properties as well, protecting them. Next. And yeah, so if you ever come out, um, probably you can come and, and visit and check this out. But in the, the No Pond, Songs Pond, and the Sanctuary Headquarters is over here. Next. This is an aerial view showing uh, this is Soames Sound, and they're coming into where the harbor area is. So we're looking from the northwest to the southeast, and then Long Pond is way over here. Okay. So this is the, the, the No Pond, and this is the Soamsville Library. And there's some wildlife photographers that are over here and shooting up, probably trying to catch an osprey that's going you know, to dive down and try to catch one day to watch coming in. And then and there's a couple of uh, volunteer counters over here. Um, so the, the water in the cove is down here, and it varies quite a bit depending on the tide level. And they've got to get from down there up to here. I'll show you that next. Okay. That was another view of the, of the mill pond in the library over here. The dam here and the ladder here. Oops. Okay. So that's, that's what they have to deal with. And with a lot of, uh, Fish ladders and passages, finding where where you need to go if you're a fish that wants to spawn in the lake uh, upstream somewhere. Um, you got to know where you're going. Usually, that's done by the, the highest flow is where they want to head for. So sometimes they'll try to get up on this um, rock, this bedrock here, but they do find their way into this um, switchback ladder here. Next one. So they'll come in this is the low tide. We have another one. Okay, all right. That's not, um, so at low tide, this is just like a long, a long ripple that goes out and it's um, well, about a quarter of a mile to get to where the, the water is in the rest of the harbor. And so they come in um, at high tides, work their way to the bottom into this pool here. This structure helps create a larger, deeper pool right here. And then they start heading up the ladder to the next slide. And this is looking um, upstream. So there's a series of wooden baffles that create steps so the fish can go one at a time and get a little bit of a break. They're super strong swimmers, the alewife and the blue bacteria. You have mostly alewife. And the bead notches and the boards are critical to have a column of water that they can push their, themselves through and work their way up um, to the top. Okay. So this is uh, the next, um, looking at the next dam going up and the next fish ladder to uh, the site of uh, the next mill that was in 1791. It's still ways over here through the woods. This is a very narrow kind of ladder that has a series of switchbacks to gain more elevation with each step in a shorter linear distance here. Next one. So this is at the bottom of it. So I follow that David Lamont here was the former director of the sanctuary and he commissioned a lot of research and, and uh, engineering and had a lot of these rebuilt back in 2005, 2006. And uh, they, they need maintenance um, uh, throughout the year. And this one's been uh, updated since then. But we're talking about very narrow passages for sometimes tens of thousands of fish that make the migration each year. Next. And here's the series of switchback pools. So they're going through a B notch stone, just pop that pool up in that. And when you get to low, lower water levels, that can be a challenge to try and get up and through that. So in a drought year, uh, fish passage is more difficult. Okay. This is the ladder that goes up in the stones ponds, the outlow stone ponds. So they're intended to go up through the middle. It's not a huge rise. And then there are these side chambers here. And the tough part is keeping fish from going 
into the sides and, and going up to the base of the dam. Once they're in there, they, they don't turn around. They think they can make it up and they'll try to climb that wall. Of course, they can't. So we have to get in and either net them over or uh, try and push them back out the bottom. So it takes a lot of fine tuning of blocking these side channels off. And it changes from when you have just inbound fish um, versus two way traffic. You got some that are done spawning, they're on the way out, and some are still coming in. You have to let them be able to get out of these side pools, but not make it so apparent that inbound fish would want to go in there. So it takes this is a kind of like a complicated machine that takes a lot of adjustments. It's not a set it and forget it type uh, system. So this is at higher water levels. And uh, so they could get into these pools here and uh, can't get up. They've got to go right through here. Okay. This is at a much lower water level. And this this was re was taken apart stone by stone and marked in 2005 and then put back together and re to to reconstruct this as part of the project that um, David had overseen. Next one. Right here's coming down with just a little bit of a pour off in between each each pool. This is the outlet of Long Pond, and so this is that higher uh, spring flow is, and we want fish to go to the latter side here, not to the bottom of this, which is a, a spillway that they can't get through. But it's really hard when you've got such big flows, and you want them to go to where the water stands stronger. But that's hard to distinguish here. Um, so we make different adjustments uh, at each of these locations. So we, we can create some kind of deflector um, baffles here and get them to go around up that way, not get into here. And here we've got a, a fish trap at the top, and we have to um, net them in, and we count each one, of course, as we go. And we do get scale samples throughout the year that we've sent to Division of Brain Resources to get an idea of population dynamics. So volunteers help do a lot of this. Next. So these are the guys that are trying to get to go up. These are our adult tail lines, the big eyes and, and fork tails. Next. And these are some of the, the juveniles that are going out there of different sizes that, you know, that are several weeks to maybe a month or two old. We're, we're capturing some of them to get an idea of emigration and uh, see how we're doing with outbound passage now with a special permit. Next. Uh, this is kind of some of our partners, and we work with all these different groups to uh, manage um, ale life in the system. And we so we got to maintain passive. We count all them, we sample, and there's a lot of education um, uh, outcomes from it. We work with the MDI Historical Society. Talk about the history of Salmsville while we're doing the focus on on fish migration. Next, and so this is some more adjustments below. Here's the spillway side. We're trying to um, block off water from this side because we want them to go up up through here. Next. And we can do that sometimes with these kind of like fence panels that shunt the fish yeah. over that way. So every year we have, um, in the spring, we start working on getting these together and um, get college students help and, and uh, younger students as well and adults. Next one. But, and this is when, when there's a period of deterioration of this uh, second ladder here, we're kind of putting in pieces of wood and, and sign boards and sandbags to try and make this work. And it was redone after this, but um, this is a, a little bit of a fragile design. Next. Next one. So it's it's a this system has a, a lot of opportunity for volunteer effort and people get a lot of rewards from doing that. This is the College of Atlantic group that was helping. And um, this fellow here uh, is part of the sanctuary staff now. He's an Elber fisherman, and um, so he's been able to join us and talk about. Um, uh, that whole migration and how that's positive they all like to where the eels are coming to spend most of their life in freshwater and going back to the Sargasso Sea to, to spawn and not return. Next. So we have a system, this is the top of the mill pond dam. There's a big chamber here and there's a, uh, 
a door that can be open and fish have to cross over this bright aluminum plate. And then someone has a hand clicker to count. We, and we open this several times a day um, and volunteers and staff are doing that. School groups also. So we're getting a, a total count from who's coming in, which is maybe a trend data. Next. Good students that do that. Um, we do lots of groups coming to, to check them out. Okay. But here the students are, are counting and waiting for fish to come out. There's a lot of anticipation of that. This is uh, Preston Taylor showing how an elver net is designed and how that works. And there's a lot of elver nets that are in this cove here in, the, in springtime. So there's an opportunity for, for kids to see the fish up close and just, just feel and touch them. Um, so it's a lot going on. Here's the general trend. From 2005, there were 360 fish that were counted coming in at uh, no pond. That's gradually gone up, but we've had some big drop off times. We can talk more later about why some of those drops might happen. This is long pond, start it later. Here's getting some scale samples, you know, which tell us about um, age. Beautiful thing. So lots of lots of predators come in when the alewife are, are running, and uh, that brings in a lot of a lot of wildlife uh, photographers and other people interested. Black tap gulls, swallowing herring gulls in a wrestling match, trying to get them off of activity, and they just swallow them all. Thanks. So we're talking uh, with the uh, MDI Historical Society folks here and National Park Service Rangers help us. So kids to get out and explore. And so these are some of the partners that we use in these programs and, and others that have uh, lots of opportunities for cooperation and, and helping each other. So lots of different possible benefits from economic, social, ecological, from these are some other collaborative efforts, but this one is actually, <laughs> and I think that could happen here too. So this is a hard thing to do, but um, we're working together to, to uh, join Simon was talking about two partners working together. So I can't really see, that's okay, I'm just talking about trying to make the most of what you've got a chance to work on here. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I should do it. Yeah. Uh, just curious if you monitored or had any folks monitoring the water quality during that same time when we saw the uptick in the, in the alewife numbers, what that would be. Able to do. There are measurements that have been taken also with water clarity and temperature and dissolved oxygen. And the, the trend we've been seeing warmer and warmer temperatures. Um, sometimes the water gets over 80 degrees in, in some pond when it could be uh, it was out there in the early summer. And I was there's less developed oxygen then. Uh, so that that is a big change that's happening with our warmer air temperatures affecting the, the water temperature. Um, we try to work on minimizing erosion throughout the system so we're not bringing in phosphorus with soil particles and potentially leading to algae blooms, which some lakes have, have had issues with. And um, that's not a good thing, obviously. So uh, it's been pretty stable during that time, but there's a lot of fluctuations that happen depending on uh, drought conditions, which last year was not like that at all, but prior ones were, and that can affect their ability to get through small little stream passages that are in the system here, maybe less so in this one. And I'm sorry, I should have been a little bit more specific, but uh, to the extent that there is any causal relationship, it, were you able to to the extent that there were any changes to the water quality that were attributable to increased fish numbers, what is, were there any observations? 
you know, I mean, it's possible to still think that we want to launch a more or find them levels and whether that triggers out migration of the, of the juveniles. Um, that and um, what you know, big rainfall events can sometimes trigger out, out migration. Um, so, but we don't know of any causal connection between what's going on yeah, with other water quality factors and emigration or numbers of fish. So um, you, you've been, your organization's been doing this since 2005. You know, what, what are you raising and spending on kind of like an average annual basis for this? Not very much for this AOI project because of all the volunteers. And I mean, it's, it's some uh, staff time for sure. Uh, they're, when we team up with the National Park and the Rangers come over, you know, they're being paid, but that's hard to get broken. But, uh, there's some maintenance things to do with fish ladders, um, like rebuilding some of those wooden baffles in the fish and meal system and like down um, off the cove. But a lot of us moving rocks around, putting those fence panels in place, and just monitoring time. We have a lot of volunteers that, that do that. So it, it's a way to get engagement, but it has it's very low cost. Um, and we have a whole bunch of people that sign up to count fish there. And people love to go from young people to older couples that ever go and be out and and um, counting them and then they use a spreadsheet to sign in put their data in so people really enjoy that opportunity to the main one and some people say well why don't we like, put a laser system in so that we you know fish crosses the embrace the beam that you know that can count and have some kind of technology like that but um People would miss the opportunity to be out there and helping uh, contribute, I think, uh, quite a bit. So it's, it's a more labor intensive, but there's lots of people who like to, to help in different ways. Thank you. Oh, Ray, and then I think you do have to talk. I guess it depends on what type of uh, uh, ladder, you know, passage uh, setup there is. Some of them are, you know, hardly anything needs to be done at all. Some of the bigger, more natural fishway type of pool, pool and weir. This one's probably some of the ones we've seen here are the most labor intensive, um, but not not very much for cost. And those wooden baffles last a long time when you place the worst one in the minimum cost. But it does take keeping logs and, and branches and sticks and stuff out of those little passages because a lot of the, the sections you saw on the stream there, fish are passing through like water that's that wide, and there could be 50,000 that are doing that, not I mean, over, over a period of a month plus. Um, so, and you can branch or a bunch of leaves get stuck in there that could that could stop them. So pay attention. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Don, go ahead and unmute yourself if you can. Okay. I think can you hear me? Am, am I unmuted? Am I unmuted? Am I unmuted? Don, can you I think it's good to up to this. Hold on, we're having some technical difficulties. I don't know how to make that work. Keep trying to unmute. How is this? Sorry, Don. Sorry, Don. We're having some technical difficulties. I am not sure that we're going to be able to make I know, our I'm sorry. sound work. Uh, I'm on. I'm on. Oh, yay! There he is. I'm on. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm not very savvy technically either. <laughs> so, anyways, okay. Oh, by the way, I'm listening to all great presentations. By the way, really fascinating. Um, the 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 dam that we dealt with here in Exeter is a uh, typical of it's a, it's a head of the tide dam. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, 
first dam constructed in the area when the colonial settlers came in in 1638. Uh, it was a you know because of the ledge and the natural falls, the first dam on the river at, around that site was constructed in 1640. So over the years, more many more dams came in, uh, you know, sawmills, grist mills. So at one time, I think they recorded something like 40 or some, 40 or so different uh, types of dams and mills along the river. Uh, during the industrial revolution, I guess we'll call it, when manufacturing became the four, uh, a group called the Exeter Manufacturing uh, started to use the river as water power, again, as every other mill, to drive their machinery. And so what they did is they constructed a dam roughly at this site and bought up all the water rights up river so they could control the flow. Uh, and the, the dam that we took down was actually reconstructed and constructed in 1914. And at the base of the dam, there was a what they call a penstock, which is basically a large water tunnel that they would open up to let the water flow into the mill, into the machine room and, dri and drive the machinery. Uh, sometimes in the 60s, like everything else in the Northeast, uh, it, didn't become, it was no longer economically viable uh, to run mills. So the mills closed up. And as some of our presenters said that tonight, uh, let's, they decided to gift the dams to the town. The gift that just, keep, the gift that just kept coming. <laughs> so the town now owned the dam and another one about four miles upstream and had to deal with maintenance issues around flooding, uh, but never really, you know, did a lot. In about 2001, our state dam bureau issued the town of Exeter what was called a letter of deficiency. Basically, they had established that this was now a high hazard dam that could not pass a 50 year flood event without overtopping the abutments. And the town was, had to do something about it. Uh, again, like everything else, when you get a state or a federal mandate, you tend to drag your feet, which we did drag our feet a little bit and uh, did some very low low-level studies. What happened, I think, to change all this was we had an historic flood called the Mother's Day Flood in 2006. Uh, some estimate it was close to a 500-year storm. The flooding behind the dam was unbelievable. Uh, we had areas that were flooded uh, for miles and miles and miles. We lost a part of uh, a mobile homes and a mobile home park about three miles upstream from the dam. The dam itself was, uh, we, we were worried about the dam and the bridge right above it, uh, whether it would hold. So I think what that did is it kicked up the the town and said, wow, you know, we really have to do something. It really is a problem. So off we went to do the, uh, to start doing much more in terms of analysis and re and uh, studies. Uh, at the time, I was on the Conservation Commission, and I was also uh, with the Exeter River Local Advisory Committee, which is, this river is one of many protected rivers in the state of New Hampshire, and it's one of the six rivers that actually feed into Great Bay. So, uh, so it's a very, you know, very important uh, uh, watershed to that aspect, for that aspect. Um, in 2010, I became uh, a select board member. And a few years later as chair, uh, I tried to push the board into putting an article on our warrant to take down the dam because that had become one of several alternatives to correct the problem. One alternative was to uh, stabilize the dam, which was to drive an awful lot of rods in there, 
uh, cement, uh, uh, build up the abutments, and really just stabilize the dam, nothing else. Another one was to uh, to put in a tainter gate, which was a gate they would control to keep the water above the dam and the impoundment, and when the flood time came, lower that. Uh, one of the alternatives was to actually remove the dam. And all the studies indicated that this, in my, my opinion, in the opinion of the, of the studies, this would accomplish, one, it would reduce the flooding, two, it would improve water quality because the impoundment right behind the dam uh, had, was impaired water at that point. It had very low dissolved <laughs> oxygen. And actually they found that in parts of that river, there were dead zones where no aquatic life at all could, could survive. And we also had to try to figure out how to take care of the migratory alewives and herring. We had a fish ladder at the base of the dam but as someone else mentioned, fish ladders just don't work as well as natural, uh, you know, fish passages. And the alewife counts and herring counts over the years have been diminishing and lower and lower and lower to the point in the last 10, 15 years, they were running as low as 900 a year to 17, 1800 a year. Really abysmal numbers. So... As I said, I tried to make our board, have our board put this on the uh, warrant uh, to vote on this, and uh, I was not successful. I had members of the board who just didn't want to do this. Uh, they didn't think we were ready. They didn't. They felt that the dam was, you know, we don't want to take the dam down. So here's the fortunate thing: is a group of citizens stepped up and put a citizen's petition on the ballot. Uh, this was a diverse group of individuals. Some had ties to the river. One was uh, owned property along the river. Uh, others were just, uh, you know, just, just not citizens. And I think this bottom-up approach was much better for winning the vote than the top-down. They held presentations. They held seminars. They brought people in uh, to address any questions that the public had. Some public questions were, well, if the river changes and I lose the river, do my property values change? Do I gain more land? Some were concerned about what this impact would be on their wells upriver. Uh, so all of these questions were, were taken into consideration and answered in a good, straightforward manner. And I'm glad to say that in 1914, 1914, 2014, at the vote, the, the article was approved with almost 70% of the vote. And so two years later, in 2016, this dam came down. And the results have just been staggering. Uh, it's, we now, last year, had an LY, estimated alewife run, a herring run, of almost 200,000 fish. Uh, the water quality has improved tremendously. As the uh, previous uh, um, presenters talked about, we now, we've had a pair of uh, nesting uh, bald eagles that have moved in and just delight everybody going up and down the river because <laughs> it's, uh, it's much more open for them to, and it's, it's much cleaner and, and met a fish. We've had seals that have come up river at certain times of the year chasing the alewives. Uh, I've had people say to me and say, you know, I was kind of skeptical of this at first. And now, not only do I love how the river looks, but I love how it, you can hear it. Because rather than just the stagnant water on the dam that just sits there, we now have these flowing, uh, flowing river through the rapids. And I've got to say, we had great partners on this. Uh, NOAA, our Department of Environmental Services, state-run department, Fish and Game, all helped us get some grant money to help pay for this. Not all of it, but a good portion of it, and helped us walk us through the process and, and uh, you know, create the uh, 
the right kind of uh, construction afterwards. So, you know, like some of the other people said, this is, taking a dam down that's been down there that's been on that site for that long is an emotional, it's an emotional decision. Uh, the, the mills for many, many years was the biggest employer in town. So there's so many people that worked at that mill or their fathers or mothers worked at the mill and that's what they knew. And it was, you know, that's where, that's, that's where they lived. That's what they saw every day. And emotionally, it's very difficult. You, you can talk about all the science-based reasons to take the dam down, but emotions kick in. And that's the thing I think we had the hardest time getting through. But I think the group of people, the normal, average day citizens, I think are really how this, this, this got passed because they understood the emotions and talked about that rather than talk about the science as the only way to do it, take it down. And so it's been a real success. I mean, we now have a couple of, I mean, and this particular dam site is right in downtown Exeter. We had a couple of restaurants that have added decks so you can sit out there overlooking the river now, sit out there on a nice evening. In May, you can watch the alewives come up and you can watch the different types of uh, wildlife who are having their meal too on the rocks and the, and the ledge below. Uh, we've had a uh, an alewife festival the last two years in the park across the river. And that has been a great turnout. We educate people, they come in, they can see the herring come up river. Uh, so all in all, it's been a, was a long, long process. But in the long run, but it's really been a great process. And I think everyone uh, has come. There's not one person now I can say that says, you know, I wish we had a dam back there again. They, you know, it's, uh, and we respected history uh, and we respected the environment. And I think uh, uh, it's, it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic project. Uh, there's talk about another dam that the town owns about four miles upstream that maybe that might be coming down next. That's going to be another emotional uh, 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 battle probably, but we'll, we'll, we'll work it out when we have to. But this one here, I think, uh, for all intents and purposes, was a, was a, was a great success. So that's it in a nutshell. And you've got some of the pictures there. Uh, one of the pictures you're showing now is a, uh, a historic sign that we put up to, uh, you know, to honor the fact that there was a great dam here. And the you can see down there is a big, big wooden uh, gate. That's part of the old dam abutment, and that was the entrance to that penstock. So that we did that, fix that, and let that remain with the machinery on top to open up that penstock as kind of a historic tribute of what was there before for many years. Thank you. Just in the interest of time, we're going to get to the, the Q and A portion of the evening. Sure. You're with us at the on stage. Um, I have a few questions that have come out of conversations with the. I'm being escorted. I've met most of you. I work for SB Environmental. We are helping the town through this process. And I work very closely with the Murakat, so I get to pick the Resources and Advisory Committee. And I am very grateful for the time because I thought such a good thing. I have a few questions that came out of some conversations with the Murakat that I would like to ask. And then we'll open it up to others. So just um, one of the big ones. Did you run into issues and or legal considerations with changes in property value, taxes, insurance, and or water level for any of the butters to the river or drip house? Anyone else? John? Well, we didn't we didn't have any we didn't come up with any legal issues. We did have a lot of questions. People were concerned again, you know. 
because the river, the impoundment behind the river, uh, with the removal of the dam, it got a little, it got a little narrower and a little shallower. So, pe first question is, do I now own more property because the river is, you know, it's not as uh, wide. And in New Hampshire, mostly the boundary lines are called the center line of the river. So I was explaining to them that, you know, they didn't gain or lose any property. Uh, the, we had our, our assessor at some of these presentations that said property values aren't going to change. Uh, so that was pretty, uh, that, that question was pretty well dismissed early. Uh, there were a few people that had questions about, well, let's dry up my wells. So we had done uh, some, uh, some surveys and studies, geomorphic studies, that showed that there was no connection to these bedrock bell wells and to the, uh, and to the river uh, uh, depth or flow. So uh, they were all good, valid questions, but there was nothing, nothing uh, legal, no legal challenges came out of this. Um, how did the aesthetic? How did the aesthetics of the river change? And like, what was the process for restoring the river after its dam modification removal? I think Matt, you did a good job of sort of showing that. But would you say, it was, you know, I think that process between any change and the final product is is hard for all of us to sort of picture or imagine. And I think, um, how long was that process? Was it painful? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the concern that we had was uh, from people who live right nearby were worried about a big muck hole. Um, that it would just be a big mud hole for a long time. But I don't know how many of you have ever tried to stop weeds growing in your garden in Maine, but Maine is like phenomenal for uh, growing vegetation. So you know, doing trail maintenance, mountain bikes, Appalachian Trail, anything like that, anybody that's ever done trail work or maintenance garden, you know, it's impossible to stop it. And, you know, we had a reservoir that hadn't seen the light of day for a long time, and it instantly, uh, by that fall, already had quite a bit of vegetation coming. Um, and it is, the unknown is very difficult, and that's, that's what it's important to have uh, engineers and landscape architects that can show you renderings. And those are difficult too because it's subjective and you're never 100% sure. Like we didn't really know what the falls were going to look like as soon as we removed the dam. There was a lot of theory and everything and it ended up being you know, a little bit to the right of where they thought it was. But for the most part, they were pretty accurate. Um, and, and the park and every, like the stream, the park, Everything about what we've done is uh, the the word that we keep hearing a lot is this is just so beautiful. It's so much more beautiful than it was before, and yeah, it's a. <laughs> I'll add a little. Uh, I would say each time, especially when a dam was coming out, I had one where I was removing a dam. And there's a lot of fear by all the pond front owners about what their shoreline is going to look like. How is that pond going to behave? What's going to be different if you don't have that dam there that's been there for most of living memory? Uh, so that that was probably the key point in so many community conversations. And it's where having the engineer come and talk about how a natural lake fish bait can work, how it will hold the water level. Uh, it's important. And getting back to the point earlier about history, you know, each one of these sites is, uh, I think what's so emotional about them is that you have to look backwards, you have to see how the water has behaved before the dam was in there, what fish were in there, where was the stream, usually it's in a different place. Once the dam has been put in there, and then in living memory, you really need to, you know, look backwards at all that and build for the future. So we're seeing these storms, these rainstorms, these events that are, are coming and more are coming. We need to look backwards, we need to look forward. And there's so much in all the decision making and the worry in crafting these with that whole spectrum of time. Maybe we'll just add real quick too that uh, 
there is a time frame where it looks really bad. You know, it's there was a time where I was going, you know, this is ever gonna look good because you know it is money in the beginning. And the entire park was a big construction zone for a long time. We had a lot of feedback from neighbors and people along the shoreline asking, when is this going to change? When is this going to change? Now, the, the stream, that came back a lot quicker than the park did because there was so much construction. And it wasn't really until uh, we had the Amazon forest dropped off in our parking lot of the park about you know, <laughs> a month before the park was completed. And once they put, it was literally like the jungle. That they dropped off, and then once they put all that in, it just was amazing with all the grass and everything. Once it vegetated, and then we're still about probably four to five years out from like it really looking the way it's meant to look, and you know, so it's a lot better now. Can I I'll, let me add something to add to that? Yeah, uh, when we took the dam down in 2016, I don't know why we changed much more well, time, but the, the private property owners along the way see. What is there in the streets and the fuel mill ponds and the, the lower part of salt ponds uh, as an asset? And uh, property values are very strong and, and um, haven't changed. Uh, it's, it's a historic district, also, so taking the mill pond uh, dam out would be pretty controversial there because it's looking out across that pond to the mountains on the other side of the island. It's, it's one of the most photographed places. Uh, on the island, even though it's a national park. Um, and there's a conservation easement that the founder of the wildlife sanctuary put on the property in 1986 to protect the view from the road by looking across the mill pond uh, towards the mountain so that nothing could be put to grow up on that on the other side or on the embankment. You couldn't put a structure there or unless trees were up to block that view. So that was put in place to, to protect that. Don, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to say that. When we, uh, I guess I'm getting feedback. I, I, am I, am I on again? Yep. When we took the dam down in 2016, we were undergoing a pretty substantial, severe drought. So, the the bad news was it made the river look like it was gone; it disappeared. It was nothing but a trickle. The good news is it's allowed us to work uh, and expose a lot of the uh, river ledge uh, that we, you know, we suspected it was there but didn't know. And that gave uh, through the, our engineers and people from NOAA and Fish and Game a way to shape the channels in such a way that it made it much more conducive uh, for the uh, for the alewives and the herring to come up. So it created. We were able to create good channels because we had a little more water. And also what we did is about from there back about a mile upstream where the water levels had dropped, we seeded all of the banks with native species. So we tried to get a hold of that, get ahead of that before non-invasives came in. So when we get the first rains in October and the river came back up to normal, we had uh, we had done a lot of good work, uh, you know, Creating a good river channels and bottom, and seeding the uh, the banks, so uh, that helps in the aesthetics. Because come the next spring, you know the site was just beautiful. It was hardly any, you know, it was very little wait time to see uh, how it repaired itself. Thank you. I am gonna open it up for Daisy. Did you guys kind of answer them already? Maggie, will you have to Hello. Um, have, I want to know if uh, the three of you have looked at the Montgomery Cook River and the various dams on the river and the elevations, etc. Have you? We went for a little we, we went for a little walk today to check out the dams. So all the way up, but not, not the whole way up. Montgomery Dam. Oh, okay. Um, from your experience and that sort of thing, would you say what 
uh, you did on your rivers would be feasible in our particular situation. I can tell you, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a director of parks and recreation. All I know is what we did. And, you know, I would probably recommend you speak to your engineering uh, team that's working on this project right now. Uh, I'm sure that Vina would probably feel those questions a little bit more. But from my perspective, no, I can't really tell you if it would be similar or how it would really work out for you compared to like how, how it went for us, because I think that they're pretty unique and individual. And that's where the experts who do this all the time. I mean, I know that there's there, there's some level of trust. And I can tell you when, when we first started this project with the town of Farmington, we had zero trust in the Atlantic Sand yeah. Federation. Right. So we had zero trust in the Atlantic Sand Federation. And throughout and, and that's just because we don't know who they are. We don't know what the agenda is or anything else. But for for me personally, for the town of Farmington, I know our retired uh, town manager feels the same way as well, Mr. Davis, that you know, we have a lot of trust and faith in the Atlantic Sand Federation. I don't know, you know, the, the organizations that you're dealing with, I don't know them really at all, to be honest with you, but um, I think you can get pretty far with trusting people's mission a little bit. And, it, it, you know, if, if the agenda is to come in and shove something down in the community's throat, it's what they want. <clears throat> You know, they're not going to be successful on their next job site because your reputation follows you. And so I think that one thing that meant a lot to us is when we checked the references for ASF and their projects, and now, I mean, I can't tell you how great they were. I mean, we literally did almost nothing. And they raised $2.1 million to give us exactly what we wanted. They didn't give us what they wanted other than the dam removal. And that's where I said it was a mutual uh, mission like it was really beneficial to us it's really beneficial to them and at some point there has to be some level of trust and you know i can't tell you who you're dealing with i mean i've met them today you know and uh they seem very nice but um i can't tell you that the organizations that i've dealt with no fisheries in them uh, fisheries and wildlife um all those organizations they even though we, we were required by the federal government to do something, um, the options were all of us. Like all the decisions that were made in our town were the taxpayer decisions. And they helped facilitate that and they helped raise the money for that. And, you know, over time, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of um, how we were treated from the organizations that we dealt with. So I have a lot of trust and faith in the process and the people who are involved in this kind of work. Um, because I don't think that there's any benefit to them to, to do a, have a bad process or a bad product that's going to follow them and ruin their reputation. So I don't think there's a lot of concern, you know, feeling like they're like tricking you or anything like that. So that's just my perspective and feedback. And I'll maybe add to that a bit um, the need for engaged citizens. So, you know, the dams that I was dealing with were owned at least in part by the, by the towns, uh, had many adjacent landowners or neighbors, and having groups of citizens at each site who cared, who came to meetings, who gave their information, who talked to their neighbors and friends and helped get the information out also is key. And I think if you have a process where there's a lot of input and where people care enough to show up and give their input and help shape the projects and help talk about them, then yes, I think you can have outcomes. Maybe not, they're not gonna look the same or be the same, but can you can you build you know, infrastructure on this river or remove infrastructure that's gonna improve it, prepare it for the future? You have buildings right on the river and a roadway over the river. It's really complicated, but something needs to happen. That can't just sit there the way it is now over time. And so with people caring enough to shape it in a way that feels like yours, like the town's, then yes, I think the town can pull together and embrace this river and figure out how it needs to be shaped to make it resilient and to the future.
Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming and presenting here in Camden. I just have a follow up to Charlie's question. We have a distinct, perhaps a unique situation in that end of tide is right at the mouth of the river. That is, the river drops about 20 feet down to the salt water, so no salt water makes it upstream, and hence no airwives. Um, if the dam were there or not there, the airwives cannot avoid the dam for now, make it up the river. So the question is, um, is, is this a comparable situation? Do any of you have a river in which the airwives were never present? Yeah, I think there's some some reports of back when Abraham Zone showed up in Zone Club, we lost their lands that there were fish that were coming up in there and they used to bucket some of them over after the dam was put in place there, but that that didn't go too far. I mean it was some effort. But uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, and uh, so there's some reports of them of, of being there beforehand, and these guys shut up very imprinted on um, where they're where they're hatched and raised and chemically imprinted and come back with very high fidelity to that that site. Uh, they don't go, you know, ninety high ninety percent anywhere else um, in the system and in some go. Long pond, some pond, there, there were some that were stocked to kind of bump the numbers up at times you know, over the years. And um, so that's that's used sometimes to start uh, something to renew what was there that was bought for some some reason. And so that didn't have any new system here, but but they had come back to the same place where they were uh, hatched. I have a couple of facts to add. So um, the current project on your aisle right now where there's a stream up to a pond being restored where there is no record of carrying or LS having been there. And the goal is still to make it passable for fish in case they want to come. So there is always a possibility that even though there wasn't a story of them or a record of them being there before, they might come back. Because as we restore the greater population, they might explore streams that they haven't been up and try to spawn them. So that's one example of a current one where there isn't a record. It's a question always, I think, but there isn't a record of fish having been there. And I think, you know, the, the last project I showed that was a road crossing, a state road crossing, was a single blockage to alewife for decades. Um, there was a great habitat upstream of that that hadn't been um, reached by the alewives. The way we were able to start around there was to stop like for four years before the project from a nearby pond mm -hmm. and a start of population, but the year after the crossing was finished, they actually were knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. So they usually stay usually come back as well for the first time in the three or four years before they were when they went passing the rock of the year shore as soon as that place and then um, come back and do the three or four years before they I think we should need a future goal. I heard you speak all speak to random concerns. I'm wondering, you know, following the project, what was the greatest impact to these variants that a typical um, variant of the dock system in a small fishing boat or in a small pontoon boat or something along the line or along the river? What was the greatest impact to the landowners? Right. Um, we don't, we didn't have anything. So we have landowners with docks, with floats, with different systems. Um, you know, it is good to remember that water levels do fluctuate a lot. 
and all of these systems have some fluctuations. The landowners are pretty familiar with that. They know on their favorite rock where the water should be at certain times of year. Some of this is a monopoly of year, so it's also been happening. Um, and we've had no landowners to develop change, no impacts to for the use of for us, uh, Long Snow Pond, it was pretty lucky. It wasn't a great water source, and, and part of that was spoken to because it was so stagnant. It would warm up so much. It wasn't really a high quality on the water system at that point. And so there weren't, and it was, you know, you're catching all this like 200 and some odd years of sediment. So it was not, it wasn't a high quality system that people wanted to have a dock frontage on. Um, people did throw their canoes and kayaks in there a little bit. Um, but um, I'd say the biggest change was, um, you know, the the lack of being able to maybe go kayak and canoe uh, out there. And then the other biggest change probably was there were several landowners that just gained quite a bit of property. Um, one farmer, within a day of the uh, the water going down, moved his fence right. <laughs> he gained a couple hundred yards of uh, pasture for his uh, his. Uh, so I, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same level of shit. So we're going to this lake will not nothing will happen from this. East, west, and see right now they're gonna, you know, at most have some fish passage out of the ventilation. Conversation about being rebuilt. Um <clears throat> water levels have changed if anything happened. So um just not sure. Yeah, I'm just like okay. Yeah. Um, great. Sure you know. so you folks up there, I think there's only one person who's telling my idea that can answer my question. There is a sign up on in the fountain along Route One overlooking Grand Lake where the main fish and wildlife have said introduction of these non indigenous fish. And destroy the ecosystem of the lake. I'm wondering if you have done any studies since you put in, you know, took out tree dams and introduced these alewives, if you've done any research on the ecosystem. On um, our system, uh, the dams have kept in place, so we didn't take any of the no removal of, of dams there. Um, so there have been other introductions of non native fish, uh, yellow, yellow perch. sediment sitting there and there was a lot of sand 
And that's the natural movement of all of these materials coming from the mountains and being cut down into coastal areas and stuff and moved through the watershed. And it was really amazing to see. We were pretty lucky to have, I mean, personally, it was really unlucky with too many flooding events we had this past year for me at the direct flood because we could have mass uh, and maybe flooding in some of our facilities. But for the new park and the watershed in the May event, it moved so much material. Uh, it was really amazing to see how things reshaped and reformed. And sometimes you have to wait for a few springs to see kind of how uh, the natural river stream bed kind of carved itself out. But we had enormous amounts of sand that were just moving down through. And we didn't have any concern. I, I don't know if there are known issues with toxins or pollution in these watersheds, but we haven't, we didn't really have that for our system. But it, we did have a lot of sediment movement that's gone down through, and it's been pretty interesting to see how how it's changed because the Sandy River has a name for a reason. The Sandy River is very sandy, and Temple Stream is just a bone. And after we removed this dam, Temple Stream has become like the Sandy River, like very sandy because all of this natural sediment that should have been moving down through the system was finally allowed to. So it's interesting on that aspect, but. Uh, as far as the other toxins. And so were you thinking of material that would be dredged out in order to do the project versus what would be flushed by the renewal of the stream in the time? Okay, that's it. Yeah. So thank you very much. And, and I think it is an important consideration that you build into your contract. So the contract with your construction company fits into where are you getting the rocks? Where are you putting the sand? But, you know, all these different aspects, it's like, it's not only overwhelming to be able to use the equipment on site, it's overwhelming because designing the contract involves all of those things, too. and you have it then. So you can get directed to the construction company where that sediment gets placed, where it doesn't get placed, and where you overlap from, what it's used to be used to plant your banks. It was really important in our case to use local stone, to use native plants, you know, give real thought to where that sediment goes and how it goes. And you build that into the So you will have that with the condition. If we pretend that there's no contamination, that the downstream sediment movement, if, if there are any salt marshes, and we don't have that many of this fish water to throw us, but uh, they need material to completely build the, the salt marsh level of the heat, maybe uh, possibly the, the sea level rise. So, um, if, if they get overrun by the amount of water, the amount of you know, material coming from inland or downstream, uh, they probably won't be able to keep up. And so, the salt marshes will, will go away eventually. There's not an area that they can migrate from a gradual slope to what is now upland. But that transport of sediment is an important process um, for keeping the potential of that salt marsh in the water basin. Okay, so Um, so you're probably mostly uh, thinking about the Melbourne Street. Um, so there's uh, other um, sites that we can see that the others that you know, um, But in Melbourne Street, there is a uh, lot um, that would be really analyzed of uh, how much is there.
Good night and good luck.